it's been a blessing to watch gold unfold and to rally and to start to reflect its true value. You know, for so long, people weren't interested in it. And now around the world, investors are getting interested and they're bidding it higher. And uh, it has to go way higher to reflect just the just torrents of fiat currency central banks around the world have injected them into the global economy. Um, the rally has been amazing in the past few months. Adam Hamilton, how are you? Oh, it's standing, Andy. How are you doing this morning? Doing good. Thank you so much for uh, joining me here today. So the last time I had you on was right. Uh, it was a small sell-off. Well, I don't say small sell-off. It drastic sell-off a little bit, but small sell-off for the uh, the miners and for gold. Just a little uh, correction there right before the summer. And I had you on, I want to say in June, you said, well, get ready. Start looking at your best stocks because seasonalities are looking good. And these are all really looking good on this pullback. And uh, lo and behold, we had a really, really strong uh, July. And I want to say August, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we're still really strong here. So let's start with gold first. We talked about it feels different. It seems different. And here we are at all-time highs. So what's your opinion now on gold? Yeah, Andy, it's been an amazing few months. It's been incredibly, it's been a blessing to watch gold unfold and to rally and to start to reflect its true value. You know, for so long, people weren't interested in it. And now around the world, investors are getting interested and they're bidding it higher. And uh, it has to go way higher to reflect just the just torrents of fiat currency central banks around the world have injected in, into the global economy. Um, the rally has been amazing in the past few months. Um, I, I was bullish, short-term bullish last time we, 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 we talked early summer. Now I'm getting short-term bearish, uh, gold's run really far, really fast. Now, just once again, this is a short-term outlook has nothing to do with the bull market. Gold's going to go way higher from a bull standpoint, but we're due for a pullback here. Uh, first gold has rallied so far, so fast. It's really overbought Andy. Um, one way I look at that is, is look at the gold price divided by its 200 day moving average, which trails it and uh, kind of mirrors, parallels its uptrend. It stretched like 17.3% above its 200 DMA this week. And that's really extreme if you look at historical standards. Anything over 15% above its 200 DMA is kind of a warning sign. Hey, we might have a pullback here. We might need to sell off rebalance sentiment and technicals. You know, all bull markets, all up legs take two steps forward then one step back. That's just the nature of the markets. And so when you have a pretty linear run like in gold, it's, it's probably time for a step back. The second thing that concerns me over the short term we're talking the next few weeks, maybe a month here, Andy, is gold futures speculators are a major driver of short-term gold trends. They run extreme leverage north of 25 times, and that gives them up to 25 times the price impact on gold as just investors buying gold outright with, with their given capital. And speculators' gold futures positioning is really extreme now. Their longs this past Commitments or Traders Week, they, they end Tuesdays, but they reported Fridays. So, so like seven days ago, the last COT, spec longs, they were at the fifth highest level since 1999, um, 441,000 long contracts. If you look at anything over 415,000 in the past five or 10 years, that usually pre precedes a gold sell-off. Um, one final thing is seasonality. You mentioned seasonality last time we talked, and it was really favorable for gold going into the autumn rally season. Um, but now that seasonality is turning negative, gold tends to experience a pullback like in the uh, kind of mid-October to late-October timeframe. And so I'm, I'm short-term bearish in gold. I think we need to uh, pull back here to just rebound on sentiment and technicals. You know, probably a bigger pullback since futures are so overextended, maybe in the order of seven, eight, nine percent. But uh, long-term, super bullish on gold. It's going to go way, way higher. Um, the main long-term bullish argument in gold for me is still the fact that American investors haven't yet started chasing this up like Andy, which just blows my mind. You know, gold's doing incredible, as you said, hitting new records. Uh, one of the best performing asset classes this year. But if you look at the holdings of the GLD and IEU gold ETFs, which American stock investors use to, to get exposure to gold, they've barely moved. They hit a 4.5 year secular low back in, in mid-March timeframe. And though gold's way higher now, they're still just a couple percent above that uh, deep secular low. So with American stock investors not yet chasing this up leg, I think gold has huge upside head after this rebalancing pullback. Yeah, it's, that's a good answer, and I I would agree with you. But I have a few questions on that. You you mentioned that there's a lot of leverage in gold right now, a tremendous amount of leverage. Is that coming from just individual traders trading the futures contracts? Uh, contracts is that coming from re retail traders, or is that coming from um, 
just big, large hedge funds and that sort of thing? Well, there's, there's two ways the COT reports are presented. One's the legacy format. It looks at commercials, non-commercials, and uh, non-reportables. Non-reportables are the retail guys you talked about. Commercials are guys who are supposed to be using gold physically in their operations, whether uh, as a consumer or producer. And the non-commercials are the speculators. And most of the, most of the leverage and go right now through futures, through Comex Gold Futures is from the large speculators, the non-commercials. But individuals, retail investors are also high for their, their data set. Um, people, that, that realm is really bullish on gold as it should be after gold has ran so far so fast. That's where the main leverage is as far as American futures is concerned. Got it. So the theory is if you get some kind of pullback, these guys that are over leveraged or that have a lot of leverage that are going to be forced to sell. And we could, this is again, very short term, and this is also tricky. Short term movements are tricky. Uh, we could see a, a just a, a downward uh, push in, uh, in the gold, gold price, correct? That's absolutely right. And they are short term. We're talking a few weeks, maybe a month on the outside. The thing about futures is when you, when you add a futures position, it's, you have to, you legally have to close that position later. So when spec logs get really high, they have a legal obligation to sell futures later to unwind those contracts. And so the higher spec logs go, the more selling is going to come after it proportionally. It just, it's just the way that market works. And, uh, say you're running that maximal leverage and you're 25 times now, Andy, if gold moves 4% against your bets, what, if you're betting for up gold upside and it falls 4%, you, you lose hundred percent of the capital risk. Is these guys have to have an ultra short-term super myopic time horizon. They can get wiped out in an hour or two on, on major economic data if gold moves the wrong way. So they have to sell fast or, or buy fast if, if they're positioned wrong. And so the futures thing is just a temporary, you know, say gold's uptrend is like this. The futures just kind of makes gold oscillate around that normal trend. And uh, just futures are really extreme right now, which is unfortunate, but that happens after gold's run far, run fast. And there's one thing, this does not have to happen. I mean, it's not guaranteed. It's happened pretty much every time in the past, but there's huge gold demand all this year from central banks and also Chinese investors. And if they keep buying, they could theoretically overpower what the American gold futures speculators are doing. That could either retard their selling, like the, the gold futures guys could say, hey, we're not going to sell because gold's still going up. There's no need to sell. There's, they don't see the downside risk. There's no big gold down days or drops off economic data. And if, if the Chinese are buying enough gold, that could make it so gold keeps rolling. And even theoretically, even if they, uh, even if the gold futures guys are selling and there's enough foreign gold demand, that could overpower the gold futures selling because the gold futures selling is really short-lived again, a matter of weeks. So it doesn't guarantee gold pullback, but just if you look at all of history, the last 10, 20 years, gold pullbacks have happened off of this kind of spec gold futures positioning. So we have to be wary of it. You know, I'm still fully deployed in gold stocks, but I've ratcheted up our stops on our newsletter trades just in case we get a pullback and I'm ready to add new positions if we get stopped out. So it's just something to be wary and watchful for right now. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So what are you seeing or any new data on the central bank buying? The last time we'd spoken, you mentioned that this is primarily, this move is being primarily driven by foreign central bank buying. Are we seeing anything different as of right now? Well, the World Gold Council produces data on that quarterly and their gold demand trends reports. They're absolutely fantastic. They're easy to read. I recommend everybody read them. They're free uh, online. Um, and for years, for, for over a decade, we've thought that the biggest central bank buyer is the People's Bank of China, you know, the Chinese central bank. And we, there's still indications that they're really big buyers, although they're not reporting their gold. You know, central banks have an incentive, especially large ones, not to report their gold buying. Because if they say they're buying, then speculators around the world will buy up gold and the central banks get a worse price. So a good portion of the larger central banks just don't bother reporting their gold acquisitions. Sometimes they'll go five, seven, 10 years, and not report any gold. And then like the PBOC did some years ago, all of a sudden they report like a 70% jump in one month, which is physically impossible. And so I think, the, I think the PBOC is still buying, but that latest GTT from the World Gold Council, it also talked about Turkey being the biggest by biggest known central bank gold buyer in the first half of 2024, Andy, which is really interesting, especially with the Israel Iran thing going on today. I wonder if that'll increase Middle Eastern gold demand. And there's, I haven't dug deep into this, but some analysts have. There's there's gold data from Saudi Arabia, and they could be cross referenced with Switzerland, like 400 ounce central bank level gold bars. That's the big gold bars, the London lbma good delivery bars and apparently saudi arabia might be a huge buyer of central bank official gold right now that that data is kind of 
hard to track down, but that's analysts who track it are saying that there's indications that it is. And so I'd say those are the main central bank buyers that we, we assume are buying or know about right now. Yeah. You know, you mentioned Turkey. That is very interesting because of their, and again, this is very speculative with what I'm about to say, but they have not yet joined the BRICS, but they are joined the BRICS. Do you know anything about that? Or is that correct? You know, I haven't been following that. I, I'm not, not familiar with that, Andy. Yeah. Maybe that's something to it. I don't know. Again, that's just speculative on, on my part. Interesting. Well, let's talk about stocks here. Um, again, last time I had you on, you were like, get ready. We're going into seasonal move here. Um, and you were actively buying stocks. And this was, I want to say, it was either late June or very early July. And here we go. <laughs> we had a really good run. Well done. Well done. Um, tell me your outlook here on stocks here. You're looking for a pullback and long term, you're really bullish, but short term, you're still bearish. Just work that out for me. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, gold is really overbought, as we discussed earlier here, but gold stocks are not super overbought. They're not extremely overbought. Really? Yeah. Um, so gold stocks have laid gold for this whole up leg since, since early October last year, um, which is really frustrating for the gold stock investors and speculators like me and you, um, and, and our, our viewers. Um, so, so I mentioned that when gold gets 15% above its 200 day moving average, that's when it's extremely overbought. For gold stocks, that metric is 30% above their 200 DMA historically. And they've not gotten anywhere near that for this whole span and for all this year, even since March when gold really started moving. And so gold stocks have been out of favor, extremely out of favor, considering how gold has rallied. So gold stocks aren't as overbought, so they don't need to correct as much or pull back as much as gold does. And this happened back in April. Um, March and April, gold also shot up. It got, it got 18% plus above its 200 DMA, Andy, which is even more overbought than this week. And gold pulled back, I think about 5.2% into, I think that that jobs report in early June, gold had a 3.6% down day. It might've been early July. There was a jobs report that was a, a, a big beat. Anyway, that was the end of gold's pullback. Or, and gold stocks didn't, didn't sell off as much as they would have normally because they weren't as overbought. But you know, gold stocks are ultimately leveraged plays in gold. So if gold pulls back that seven, eight, nine percent to rebalance speculators, gold futures positioning and sentiment and technicals, Gold stocks are going to get sucked in, but maybe they won't leverage that by two or three times like typical. Maybe they'll leverage it by, you know, 1.8 times or 2.2 times. It's probably not going to be big downside for gold stocks, but nevertheless, you know, probably get stopped out. Gold stocks are a volatile sector and when they move, they can really move. And it also depends on how fast gold's pullback unfolds. If gold, you know, falls really fast, like two, 3% down days, gold stocks are going to get hit hard because that spawns a lot of short-term fear. If gold pulls back gradually over a few weeks, say, sub 1% down days, gold stocks won't fall as much because there won't be as much fear generated. So I do see a short-term gold stock pullback coming, but gold stocks remain just incredibly overvalued, undervalued, both for prevailing gold levels and just the phenomenal massive record profits they're spinning off right now. Yeah. I uh, read somewhere you're looking at 40 to 50% margins in some of the, uh, the bigger names, if you would, the new months of the world, which is just crazy to me. Yeah, it's yeah. epic. It's it's extraordinary. I can't believe that institutional investors aren't beaten down the door to this sector yet. I think they will, but I I suspect that the AI stock bubble is just distracting everyone still. You know, with, with U.S. stock markets at record highs, people just aren't looking for alternatives. And so gold's just out of sight, out of mind right now, despite its amazing year. And therefore, if people aren't interested in gold, they're not interested in its minor stocks. It's good for us, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. More time to buy, more time to accumulate. Exactly. And so... Um, are you looking into layer in some of the major producers here? Uh, if we get a pullback or are you looking to add just to some of your favorite, uh, juniors, uh, on a pullback? You know, I've never been a fan of the majors because they tend to underperform the mid tiers and juniors. The majors operate at such vast scales. You know, we're talking 2 million super majors are 2 million plus ounces a year. Majors are 1 million plus ounces a year. They have a really hard time consistently growing their output. Investors prize production growth above, every, above everything else because it generates positive cash flow, which they can use to fund expansions, mine builds, just to grow. And also the majors and super majors have such large market capitalizations, even though the sector is small, that for a given amount of capital inflows, it just doesn't move their stocks much. So I've always preferred mid-tiers and juniors. Mid-tiers being 300K to a million ounces a year and juniors less than 300K. They just they have fewer projects, they have smaller production, they're able to consistently grow their production because if they add a new mine, it can up their production by 50, 100%. Uh, they have expansions, they generally operate at lower lower mining costs, lower all-in sustaining costs, which blows my mind because the major's big selling point is they have these economies of scale. 
Yet every quarter when I dig through this data, the top 25 GDX and GDXJ gold miners, I find that the mid-tiers and even juniors sometimes have lower costs than the majors. And so they just, they're better all the way around, uh, better upside potential, better everything. So I, I try to avoid the majors. There's a few exceptions here or there that are great majors, but for the most part, stick with the mid-tiers and juniors. Stick for mid-tier. Mid-tier and juniors, do you, uh, are you interested in the ETFs, GDX and GDXJ at all? You know, I, I do a lot of research on GDX because that's the benchmark of choice for gold stocks. Um, but the problem with GDX is that it's dominated by those super majors. They, they might represent 50, 60% of its entire weighting, Andy. And so if super majors are lagging gold stocks in general, then GDX is held back by kind of the deadweight super majors that, that dominate its weighting. GDXJ is an amazing ETF. If you want to go ETFs instead of individual stocks, which is totally understandable, GDXJ is the way to go. Vanek calls it a junior gold miners ETF, but that's misleading. Like 10, 12% of its weighting is true juniors. The rest is mid-tiers. It's really a mid-tier gold miners ETF. Um, it's kind of a sweet spot between the, the risky smaller juniors and the, the super majors and large majors. They're just too big to grow consistently. And so, yeah, GDXJ is awesome. Yeah. That's great advice. Um, so in light of this pullback here, like, and then when I say in light of this pullback, the pullback that we think will come, but again, it's not written on, uh, you know, stone tablets here. <laughs> um, what, what should investors really be on the look for, um, from now this quarter, from now until the end of the year, what would you, uh, what would you say? You know, the pullback shouldn't last long in Q4. It generally seasonally gold bottoms in like the third week in October. So if the pullback happens soon, it should be over in two or three weeks on the, on the outside. Um, so I think November and December should be really strong for gold. It's a strong time seasonally. If we get the pullback out of the way and gold future, gold speculators positioning gets, gets rebalanced and normalized and mean reverted, that should make plenty of room for gold to rally. Then there's that big wild card. You know, again, American stock investors haven't started chasing this gold up yet. If they start buying gold ETF shares at a rapid pace, gold's just going to skyrocket. You know, go, this gold up leg is already up like 46% at best, Andy, some, somewhere there. There were two gold up legs. This is the biggest gold up leg since a pair that both crested in 2020. They're both 40% plus gold up legs. And they were driven by on the order of 400 metric tons of, of buying of gold ETF shares. Like when people buy gold ETF shares, the gold ETFs have to buy physical gold bullion to shunt that excess demand into gold. Otherwise the gold ETF price, the couple from the, from the gold price. And so, so we're talking plus 400 tons of, of gold ETF demand from gold ETF share buying and those two up legs in 2020. And there's been like, I don't know, 30 tons this time around in this gold up leg. So if we get another 350, 400, 500 tons of gold demand through gold ETF buying, gold's going to skyrocket. And I really think that could start in Q4. You know, this pullback is kind of like a mid-October to late-October thing if it happens. And so, yeah, beyond that, Q4 should be fantastic with strong winter seasonality. Right. So uh, get your shopping list uh, ready, right? And then uh, if this is a pullback, it sounds like you believe, and I believe it'd be a great opportunity for investors. Without a doubt, pullbacks offer the best mid-up like buying opportunities to add positions in, in the sector stocks. And the, the same is true in gold stocks. And so... You know, a lot of people, people like buying high, people like chasing winners, you know, greed and euphoria builds the, the higher prices run, the faster they run. But the time to buy is after a pullback when that sentiment gets knocked back, bled off a bit. And so, yeah, just do your homework. Um, I'm really looking forward to the, the next quarterly results from, from the gold miners. They're coming out, say, from the third week in October to the, the second week in November. And they're going to show the highest profits ever by far. I know that because the average gold price is the highest ever by far for Q3. And the gold miners, the vast majority of them predicted lower all-in sustaining costs for the second half of 2024 compared to the first half. In the first half, they ran around 1250-ish. So if they drop, you know, two, three, four percent on average, um, that combined with highest gold price is going to make for just absolutely enormous profits. We're talking unit profits in excess of $1,200 per ounce, Andy. That's that 50% margin you're talking about. That, that you've read about. It's just the profits are just absolutely phenomenal in this sector. There's nothing like it in all the stock markets that I'm aware of. It's incredible. Yeah. That I'm aware of as well. Adam, so people want to do business with you um, and want to consume um, your uh, your work. How do they go about doing that? Well, for a quarter century now, we published a couple of newsletters. We have a monthly called Zeal Intelligence and a weekly called Zeal Speculator. They're priced for just individual investors, about $10 an issue, really inexpensive. Uh, I analyze gold and gold stocks and when appropriate, I add new gold stock trades and I, I fared out the best of the, 
the, the fundamentally superior mid tiers and juniors, and we have positions in those. And with a pullback probable, you know, it's a great time to get subscribed and, uh, and see what we're doing on trading front in the next month or so. So love to have you stop by. Our website is zeallc.com. Yeah. And for all of our viewers and listeners, I've been a follower and fan of Adams for over 20 years. Adam does not pay me a thing to promote this. And I would be one of your biggest promoters, but it's the value that you offer for the money is uh, second to none. So I'm a huge fan and a huge follower. So thank you so much for your time, Adam. I know you're incredibly busy, but you made time for me and I really do appreciate that. Thanks for having me, Andy. It was great chatting with you as always. Yeah, always. And uh, yeah, I'll have you on again before the end of the year. We'll see where we're at. Take care.